Spencer Chase with AgriPulse. You talked a little bit about in your speech about infrastructure development and a, a bit of a long-winded question, I apologize in advance, but someone once uh, gave me a quote that they attributed to... Uh, Can you introduce yourself? Yeah, Spencer, yeah, yeah. Spencer Chase with AgriPulse. Um, they, they attributed this quote to Dr. Borlaug when they told it to me, it was that he recognized the need for more roads, more improved infrastructure on, on the African continent, but there was also a concern, and I don't know if this was his words or theirs, there was a concern about the use of that infrastructure in those roads by, uh, you know, in a potential war event or during some kind of a conflict. So how do you balance the need for an improved infrastructure for agricultural production with the potential concern that that infrastructure might be used for a potential negative purpose at some point down the road? Well, you know, infrastructure is a basic thing for development. Um, if you take a look at Africa, for example, you have 645 million people that don't have access to electricity. And so when you don't have access to electricity, um, you don't have competitiveness. You cannot create jobs. Uh, you cannot um, also do digital banking. And so that's why for us as a bank, we are investing $12 billion in that because I, I believe that electricity is like blood in your body. Uh, if you have you know, blood, you, you, you have life. If you don't have blood, you don't have life. And so we as a bank, we invest in $12 billion in universal access to electricity in Africa, and we're hoping to leverage anything between 45 and $50 billion on that. I say that because if you look at the areas where terrorists operate, terrorists love dark places where there's no light. And so when you provide universal access to electricity, you also help in dealing with security, security matters. If you also look at the amount of investment that we need for infrastructure, think of the need to connect landlocked countries to coastal countries. So the cost of actually getting stuff into the landlocked countries is very, very high. And so which actually worsens poverty there. And so the African Development Bank invests quite a lot in transnational highways. We invest in, ro in, 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 in rail, in ports that will link, link countries together and therefore connect those landlocked countries better. Uh, the, the other part of it, of course, is if you look at the trend of poverty. Everywhere you have good roads, you see poverty declining. Why? Because people can make a living. Access to goods and services is a lot much, uh, much easier. Markets develop, services and logistics develop around those. So I don't think that infrastructure necessarily is what will create a negative externality in terms of people using it wrongly. If even if you don't have it, people always do that. But for us in Africa, we need to close Africa's infrastructure gap very, very quickly. And if you look at the amount that is needed for that, it's a lot. It's anything between $68 billion to $108 billion that will be needed you know, to do that. And so as a bank, we are investing a lot of money in infrastructure. We are also investing a lot of money. We set up... Um, a new uh, private equity fund that's called the Africa 50, uh, which is now capitalized to about $863 million to leverage private capital into going into infrastructure, whether it's power, roads, or, or, or rail and ports. And so infrastructure is critical, and I think that you cannot develop without it. A follow-up, if I may. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned some of the dollar figures, some of the costs that you were looking at to develop this infrastructure. I'm wondering in terms of how much time do you think it will take before, you know, optimistically speaking, if everything works just as, he, as you'd like it, how much time do you think it would take for Africa to have a, a sufficient level of infrastructure for its agriculture? Well, I think that the, the issue is infrastructure costs a lot of money. And so you can't have it, you can't spray, you know, sprinkle it like powder all over the place. You have to find places in which you concentrate on infrastructure. So I don't think Africa needs to necessarily wait until it has all the infrastructure it needs before it develops. What it needs to do is to optimize around existing infrastructure. Um, for example, I, I said in my remarks uh, that the development of what we call staple crop processing zones are vast areas in the rural Africa wherein you put in consolidated infrastructure, power, water, roads, and also ICT infrastructure. Now, that is going to make sure that you can create new growth engines in rural areas, but by consolidating in existing uh, uh, infrastructure, but also prospective infrastructure that you are going to be, to be making. 
If I take the case of electricity uh, that I mentioned, um, I think that our own um, goal as a bank is to work to make sure Africa has universal access to electricity within the next 10 years. Hey, look, 1863 was when uh, Thomas Edison or so de developed the light bulb. We shouldn't, in today's uh, age, be trying to light that up. You know, that's it's a basic thing. Um, and, and I think that the figures that I was talking about is all within the next 10 years. I think Africa has to very much accelerate uh, the, 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 the um, uh, uh, infrastructure density. And um, we, we are setting up, uh, launching this year, uh, what's called the Africa Investment Forum uh, to leverage global pension funds and sovereign wealth funds and other institutional investors to invest in infrastructure. If you take a look at funds under management today, pool of pension funds under management, probably about seven pools, about $100 billion a year. And yet you have a, a gap of about 68 to $100 million, uh, billion dollars, uh, for, for Africa. So the key is how do we move that capital from where it is to Africa where the need is, and that's why the African Development Bank set up a lot of instruments that will help to de -risk, reduce the risk of investments uh, on infrastructure uh, in Africa, as well as also developing pipeline of bankable projects that people can uh, also uh, uh, invest in, and promoting the role of private sector in the infrastructure space. If you take, for example, energy, um, if, for example, the cost of energy uh, the pricing of energy tariff is not reflective of the cost, obviously, which private sector is going to invest in that. So as a bank, we help to also improve the policy, uh, the legal and regulatory environment around infrastructure financing so that it pays for the private sector to invest in infrastructure. Now yes, sir. Well, first and foremost, let me talk about the structure of agriculture. And if you go to, if you're in Washington, and you look, or any city you are in, you look at the skyline, you have, you know, um, one-story building, you got five-story building, you have skyscrapers, right? Well, not in Washington, that's going to be taller than the capital here, but I get your point on the question. What I'm saying on that is the fact that agriculture in Africa should not remain small. Africa needs small, medium, and large farmers. And we shouldn't always become so romant romanticized about agriculture that just basically is an agriculture that creates a lot of penury, right? I, I haven't seen any farmer that wants to be poor. So what we should be promoting is viable agriculture, commercial-oriented agriculture. And even the smallholder farmers that you see, they are private sector entities. The only difference is that they are poor because they don't have access to technologies, to markets, to finance, to infrastructure, to information. So what we ought to do is you can't condemn smallholder farmers because they are poor. What we've got to do is to make sure we improve the environment around them so they can increase their productivity and also benefit from agriculture. The second one is very important because Young people are not going to go into agriculture with ho hoes and cutlasses. I don't believe the hoes and cutlasses belong in agriculture. I think it's suffering. I, I grew out of poverty, so I know poverty is not pretty. You know, young people want an agriculture that is modernized, with access to tractors, with uh, ICT information, using drones to be able to map the areas of their farms, and why not? And so the kind of agriculture that I'm pushing for in Africa is a more modernized agriculture, where you have you know, um, uh, a lot of opportunity for smallholder farmers, create a new generation of farmers as well, and also use infrastructure to attract agribusinesses into, uh, into, um, uh, into, uh, 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 into rural, uh, uh, rural areas. But as I say that, I must mention that the issue of 
property rights, access to land for smallholder farmers in their communities is sacrosanct. We've got to make sure that smallholder farmers and communities lands are well demarcated, they have access to uh, land titles, and therefore when they negotiate with um, businesses that come to their communities, they actually have access, uh, access to that. Um, but in summary, what I want to say is that we need a more dynamic agricultural system where smallholder farmers are given opportunity, a new generation of uh, medium and large scale farmers develop but operate well with communities and, and smallholder farmers. And to follow up on that, um, we'll be looking at infrastructure in terms of the, the overall evolution of discussion on global food security. You know, you've heard for a long time a lot of emphasis on improved seeds, improved inputs, et cetera, et cetera. I've always wondered what would happen to these bumper crops if you couldn't send them anywhere. I mean, is infrastructure the next step of this puzzle? Do you see this becoming a more salient feature of food security discussions as a point of emphasis? Yeah. Absolutely, because if you take a look at smallholder farmers trying to produce food, the issue is that Africa today, the amount of food we lose is enough to feed 300 million people. And so the question is investing well in storage systems, in warehousing, and having commodity exchanges where people that produce surplus can be able to trade uh, those the same way it works here with Chicago, uh, uh, you know, uh, Board of Trade Exchange and all of that. Yes. Well, if you look at some of the exchanges that are working, they're actually working. It's not that they failed. The, the fundamentals of building an exchange is that you must raise productivity first to be able to have enough to supply to. Uh, to not necessarily. Uh, you, you have, uh, for example, in, in Rwanda, what's called the East Africa Commodity Exchange, which works very well. You have Apex in Nigeria, which is working extremely well with uh, so many hundreds of thousands of, uh, of farmers. Um, you have a lot of work on warehousing facilities in Zambia. You have it in Nigeria. You have it in, in Tanzania, in Mozambique, where people can have access to warehouses where they can sell and get a warehouse receipt system which allows them to go to the market, to the, to the banks, and borrow money. And this is working all across Africa. So it's not, I don't see, I don't see that. You take a look at Ethiopia. Take a look at Ethiopia Commodity Exchange, one of the best that you have. So I think the key is, it's working. The commodity exchanges are working. We need a lot more of them. Uh, but the critical thing is to make sure that both the volume, which requires then investment in productivity enhancement, is met, but also the point that was raised in terms of the quality and the timing and cost effectiveness of delivery um, to those exchanges, what makes them actually uh, function. And I think that commodity exchanges will work a lot faster in Africa today because of the mobile phone technologies that we have. You know, it's easier for uh, farmers now to have access to market price information than it used to be. Uh, 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 in Africa. So at the end of the day, I think that infrastructure will allow incentives uh, for smallholder farmers and other farmers to be able to take advantage of market opportunities. Yes? Um, you mentioned malnutrition in your previous comments. Uh, what are some of the things that you are encouraging farmers to do and what are the technologies that is being pushed in the United States actually with the increased nutritional value of seeds and the crops that come from them uh, through GMOs? How does uh, the bank can, how, how, what position is the bank taking on things like GMOs? Well, if you take a look at the issue of um, malnutrition, it's clear that the most important infrastructure to build is the, is the brain infrastructure, is the gray matter infrastructure. So I have been pushing that this is what we got to do, that, that malnutrition is not a social issue. Malnutrition is an economic issue because stunted, econom stunted children today will give you stunted economies tomorrow. And if you look at how much Africa has been losing from malnutrition, it's quite significant. It's almost about uh, $25 billion. Uh, a year that it costs Africa. So fixing malnutrition is actually building the future economies for Africa going forward. Now, the issue is 
Where are some of the ways in which you fix that? First is Africa has today biofortified crops. And in fact, I won the World Food Prize last year, but before me, in 2016, the team that, it were, that was given the World Food Prize was the team that worked on the biofortified crops. And biofortified crops, by the way, just to be clear, are not GMOs. Um, these, um, if you take biofortified high lysine maize, it's there. If you take, for example, orange flesh sweet potato, which is actually has a lot of pro-vitamin A in it, and has helped a lot in Mozambique to reduce malnutrition and stunting significantly. You have iron fortified beans in Rwanda that is helping uh, a lot with mothers that would normally suffer from quite a lot of uh, deficiencies in iron. Uh, you have also iron fortified uh, sorghum uh, that, that's there. So biofortification is a, very, is a cheap way, it's the cheapest way to have nutrients loaded crops that farmers can grow themselves and use it. And they are not GMOs, by the way, just to be clear. The second thing is the development of high energy foods. Because today, over 90% of all the high energy foods that Africa imports, I mean uses, is imported from Europe, from Latin America, and from Asia. Now, what does it, what's the, what does it take to produce high energy food? You need to have access to maize, which is corn, I need access to soybeans, that's it. Africa produces that in abundance. So I don't see any reason why Africa is importing high energy foods. Africa should be producing in Africa uh, high energy foods and, and create a lot of markets for, uh, for, its own, um, for its own farmers. The other issue with uh, nutrition, obviously, is uh, maternal health is critical. And in particular for kids, the first 1,000 days matters. Because if, if you lose access to good nutrition the first 1,000 days, that's it. And you cannot reverse the negative consequences of malnutrition, especially stunting and wastage that results as a result of that. So uh, we as a bank have been at the front guard of um, effort to push on the reducing malnutrition in Africa. And that's why we um, got the support of the African heads of state uh, to create what's called the African Leaders for Nutrition. And the African leaders for nutrition will also put forward what's called African Nutrition Accountability uh, Index, which means that we want to hold leaders accountable, countries accountable, for the malnutrition and the stunting that we see today. So that's on the policy side, on the political side. Uh, and, and what I told you earlier, I want is on the, on the technology side. Well, let me just close by saying that it is not ideology that feeds people. It's technology, science, that feeds people. And sometimes I take a look and people criticize the United States for uh, GMOs. And I wonder, New York, everybody comes for United Nations meetings every September. They eat corn, they eat soybeans. I've never seen anybody developing horns from that and the numbers continue to increase, not reduce. So I think what's important is to recognize the importance of science, to recognize the need to have good regulatory control of science, to have issue of food safety and consumer awareness of you know, benefits and negative things that you may have from, uh, from um, uh, technologies. Um, I just flew into the United States this morning, and I flew and we're flying over 50-something thousand feet above sea level. That's risky, but they've, they've managed the risk so much that you don't even notice it. You, you, you drink your wine and you sleep. You know, so it's all about how you manage risks uh, in agriculture.